some of my history with this, uh, as well as some comparisons to other methods, and, and where does this really stand in terms of approaches for uh, key phrase extraction, and really for, for entity linking, I think is the broader scope, and some work with knowledge graph. Um, the, the slides, by the way, they are online. If you want to grab them, uh, same slides that I'm showing are online, and I will make sure that uh, this exact copy is also provided as PDF, so you can host it on your website as well. So the first part is a little bit of background, some of the theory about natural language understanding. And there's a, a premise that <clears throat> whenever we're working with text, actually whenever we're conveying information to text, there are implicit links where parts of the text, by its nature, will refer back to other parts. So when we write a text document, you know, we, we generally don't structure our language solely as if it's just a, a concatenation of statements, logical facts, uh, syllogisms, that sort of thing. Instead, when we compose some sort of text, whether we're writing a report or uh, publishing a paper or just even writing email to a colleague, when we use natural language, we tend to use a lot of very nonlinear constructs. There are narrative arcs where uh, sort of the pace and, and some of the details about a story, they, they ebb and flow. There are techniques for foreshadowing where you're giving some indication of what will happen later. There, there's the inverse, there's callbacks, of course, which are used a lot in comedy, uh, where you make uh, quick witty references to something that happened previously. On and on, and, and, and we can talk about a lot of different ways that you get these kind of nonlinear referential links throughout text, um, whether you're talking about an introduction or a summary, whether you're talking about compare and contrast, which is a, a kind of semantic relation, really, um, whether we're talking about some of the, the more formal parts of, of grammar, the major tropes like metaphor, synecdoche, metonymy, simile, etc. Uh, and, and what this means is that in text, there is this kind of implicit semantic reference from different parts of the text to other parts of the text. So in other words, text is linked to data. It just may not be apparent. Now to, to put this into practice then, suppose we have a small document, somebody is telling a personal story and they're talking about their pets, uh, maybe they have a cat or some cats. Uh, maybe they have some dogs. They're discussing and doing a contrast uh, about the two of them. But they will make references to those entities probably multiple times. The things that are important in the document tend to be reinforced in multiple ways. And so in this sense, you can consider that the entities cat and dog have multiple linked references. And so that brings us to uh, the person who really thought this out and proposed this, <clears throat> Radha Mahasya, and also her graduate advisor, Paul Tero. Uh, they did the paper Text Rank, Bringing Order into Text. That was in 2004. Uh, that was when uh, Radha was a graduate student at uh, Let's see, that University of Northern Texas. Uh, and I, actually, a, a friend of mine was one of her research partners. Um, I found out about this paper about two years later. Uh, and I've got links currently, uh, both to Paul Tarot back at UNT, as well as uh, Rada is now a professor in computer science at uh, University of Michigan. So, this paper, Text Rank, uh, it really struck me when I first read it. Uh, it just really, really resonated because at the time I'd been doing a lot of NLP work, but you know, we were working with uh, libraries in Java. Uh, there was the open LNLP stuff, and you know, we did a lot of work with work and whatnot. It was a lot of Java code, it was kind of painful. Um, and here was somebody proposing a very 
lightweight approach uh, that leveraged graph algorithms. And, and it, it really seemed like this would have uh, a way forward. So in the paper, uh, I'll, to, to paraphrase the authors, in the paper we introduced TextRank, a graph-based ranking model for text processing. And they show how it can be successfully used for natural language applications. In particular, they have two unsupervised approaches, one for extracting key phrases and one for sentence extraction, which is, they use it for a kind of extractive summarization. And they show in the paper that the accuracy achieved uh, is competitive with previous state-of-the-art. Um, but most importantly, this last sentence, an important aspect of text rank is it does not require deep linguistic knowledge, nor domain or language-specific annotated corpora. And it makes it very highly portable to other domains, genres, and languages. And, you know, this has been the part that's really resonated for me because uh, whereas there, there are incredible language models these days and really sophisticated work on named entity resolution and, and other, uh, you know, aspects of annotating text, um, generally speaking, most of those approaches require a lot of training. And many of them, to get high predictive power, tend to, to need to be very specific for the kind of domain language. Um, whereas with text rank, if you can parse a sentence correctly, uh, you're getting very close to some guarantees of getting very interesting phrase expression. So to describe the algorithm, uh, just to give it a pseudocode from the paper, there are four parts. Uh, number one, you identify uh, vertices in the graph, text units that are, it could be a noun or a token, uh, but it's some sort of text unit and it's providing a, a, a potential node in a graph. And then you identify relations that connect these vertices. Uh, the relations become the edges between those vertices. And it's important to note that the graph can be either directed or undirected. In fact, there's some benefits of it being undirected. Uh, and then third, iterate on the graph uh, using a graph algorithm until it converges. Uh, and then go back and sort the vertices in the graph based on their score from the ranking algorithm. And that's used for extracting out what are the, the, the most referenced entities within the text. Now, if you want to put this into terms of how to implement it in code, uh, I would break that down into seven parts. Uh, number one, parse a text, segment it into sentences. For each sentence, slide through all the tokens, finding the part of speech and the lemma for each, each word, and then construct a graph. Uh, the graph is undirected and the links are based on uh, having a sliding window, uh, typically of window width three, uh, where you're looking at the adjacency of nouns and adjectives. And also, frankly, looking at verbs does help. Importantly, you also look for repeated instances of the same word. And when you find those, you link them together as well, even across sentences. Uh, and then once you have this graph, the next step is simple, uh, running page rank, really, uh, effectively eigenvector centrality. And with the rankings then that are assigned to each node in the graph following that algorithm, then you can go back and aggregate the ranks for each noun phrase and extract those out as the top key phrases within the text. Um, and so to show an example, uh, this is a, a math paper that was referenced in the original paper by, by Radha Mahasya, uh, and it has to do with natural numbers and linear Diophantine equations. I, I have a math degree. I had never heard of most of these concepts, uh, like, like Diophantine equations. Uh, so this is very domain specific for a particular area of math. Um, so let's just say that we start with something like this, which is you know, a relatively difficult uh, piece of language and has very specific kinds of terms. But if we can parse those sentences, again, getting the part of speech and getting the lemmas, then 
uh, as shown here on the right side, we can begin to construct a graph. And so this is a very simplified graph, but it shows the basic idea of where, in this case, the nouns and adjectives are linked together, both by if there's repeated instances of them and by their adjacency. And then down in the bottom left, it, it's really interesting. Um, the, the ground truth that they used to evaluate this method was to take a look at papers which had been assigned keywords by human annotators. Uh, these could be conference reviewers, uh, paper referees, peer reviews, et cetera. But th they had a corpus of, of that. And so when you, when you look, uh, it's interesting that both the coverage of the key phrases, uh, which is to say recall, as well as the ordering of the key phrases in terms of the ranking, um, it's very close between what the text rank algorithm produced and, and what was assigned by human annotators. And so the authors say intuitively text rank works well because it, it, it doesn't only rely on the local context of uh, a text unit of a, say a, a token or a phrase, Instead, it takes into account information which is recursively drawn from the entire text. And I, again, this is a, a phrase that's really resonated with me, and, and I've, I've really seen it in practice. And so instead of looking at just text uh, token by token analysis, um, or say bag of words or something like that, instead, we really are trying to look holistically at a text and draw as much understanding from it as we can. Uh, and well, I, I probably don't need to go into this. This is just kind of a summary, but it, you know, definitely uh, this is a, a lightweight but effective algorithm for extracting entities from a text. Um, it doesn't require prior domain knowledge, um, but it can definitely leverage prior domain knowledge. And also it's an ineffective way to do extractive summarization. Uh, you know, frankly, I think that there are much superior methods of doing text summarization, um, you know, typically abstractive generative types. But if you just want to do something quick, extract summarization, uh, this is very efficient. And, uh, and also the last part here about theory, I, I highly recommend, uh, this is a, a video that Rada did about four years ago. Microsoft Research in one of their symposiums, uh, but she, it's about an hour long, it has some really good Q&A, and Rada goes into a lot more detail about comparisons with other algorithms and benchmarks and analysis that they've made, uh, you know, really goes into a lot more of, of uh, that kind of analysis of the approach. So uh, the next part is implementation. And so currently, uh, I'm lead committer for PyTextRank, uh, among other things. But uh, we, we just got a pull request in. We just got accepted uh, the past couple weeks uh, to be part of Spacey Universe. So uh, PyTextRank is implemented as a, a pipeline extension for Spacey. Um, and so there's information on the Spacey website. Uh, it's also available on PyPy, so you can do a pip install. Uh, you can also do an install through Conda. And, uh, and of course, it, it's on GitHub. The main project code issue management, all that is, is over on GitHub. Uh, installation is pretty quick. Just do you know, pip install PyText rank. But you do need to make sure that you know, because of the spacey dependency that you've uh, downloaded the kind of language model that you need. Uh, as an example for using the code, uh, really it's pretty quick. Uh, import Spacey, import PyText rank, load a language model, and then what we do is we we create a text rank object and insert it into the Spacey pipeline. Uh, insert it at the end. So by default, unless you've put other extensions in already, uh, this will go right after named entity re resolution. And then, uh, you know, specify text and run Spacey uh, to create a document. Uh, it, of course, if you're if you're not familiar with Spacey, it's a, a very fast, uh, very opinionated API for NLP. 
Uh, it provides this concept of non-destructive overlay for the tokenization. So essentially, they produce a doc, uh, a document which is really a long array of all the tokens in the document, and from that you can you can use that to index to individual tokens okay. or to sentences or to phrases or to entities, and then gather other annotations and metadata for each of those. Uh, and to use the uh, Pytex rank in, uh, at the bottom we just show a very simple iterator. We iterate over the phrases uh, that are extracted. And for each phrase we can show, you know, what was the, the rank metric, um, how many times did the phrase appear overall in the text, and what's the most representative text, raw text, for that. Um, and we can also show some additional information. I, I showed, for instance, some of the chunking that was related. Uh, now, in terms of, of implementation, uh, if you want to take a look and see how this algorithm has been put together, there's a, a Jupyter notebook inside of the GitHub repository that goes through and explains the algorithm step by step. Um, and, and so literally every function that's used, uh, we try to break it down and show what inputs are going in, how is it functioning, how can it be debugged, and then what are the outputs from it. And so, you know, here are a couple of the, the methods. Uh, really, this is the part for constructing the graph. Um, I should mention also, uh, spacey architecture is just a, it's a joy to work with it. Uh, really, really well thought out architecture, and it's evolved over time too, but uh, I, I really like working with it. Um, and so they have the notion of sort of a common architecture, but then they have different, for different languages, they have different models, uh, and the base data for any language then will, will handle the customized parts. You can think of it as that way. Uh, the main point, though, is at the bottom, you tend to have this, this pipeline view of how the different stages of processing are, are being invoked. And so uh, text rank comes in, like I say, right after uh, named entity resolution, the NER uh, module. And really, the, the integration, adding a pipeline extension into Spacey is, is super simple. Um, I, I just, uh, you can see the code for it down there. It's really only a couple of lines of code. Now, I, I want to talk about some of the dependencies on this too, because I think that that's instructive. Um, definitely Spacey, you can probably tell I'm quite a fan. And uh, also, you know, talking with Matt Hannibal and Inez Montani and the other folks working at Explosion, uh, they're super nice, super smart. They, they handle this in a, in a really great way. I, I really think it's an exemplary project for uh, open source project governments. There's three other projects that are also important for this work. Uh, definitely NetworkX. A lot of uh, Pytex rank is based around NetworkX. And uh, I, I enjoy using it because if you do have, uh, you know, memory on your server, um, this will allow you to do some pretty interesting graph algorithm work without having any need for uh, uh, external graph database. Uh, so, you know, by definition, orders of magnitude faster. Um, but also, you know, I've, I've worked with other frameworks like GraphX and, uh, you know, so, some distributed processing uh, frameworks that provide graph algorithms. And I, I just find that, that network X is, is a lot simpler, a lot more straightforward, certainly for debugging. Uh, another library that I really highly recommend is called Data Sketch. If you haven't seen it, Data Sketch is great for uh, approximation algorithms, also called sketch algorithms, uh, also called probabilistic data structures. And so uh, this is in Python. And if you're working with a lot of data or say a lot of measurements, um, if you haven't seen approximation algorithms before, actually I have some other tutorials on that, but the, the basic idea is that when we're working with big data, we go through large workflows, we crunch a lot of data, we come up with numbers or parameters for some sort of decision point, some sort of result, And typically we round off the end result. Um, with approximation algorithms, what you can do is 
determine how much you're going to round off in advance, and then propagate that error all the way back through the workflow and use hash collisions to describe probabilistically how much error you're going to introduce. So for instance, by doing a trade-off typically of about 3 to 4% error, you can gain about two orders of magnitude reduction in memory footprint um, and similar gains in computation. So if you, if you have to work through a large corpus of documents and you want to take some measurements, uh, this is really ideal. Uh, for instance, a lot of Twitter's internal analytics were based off this originally, uh, or a similar package uh, called Algebra. Lastly, there's Ray, uh, and I'm getting to work some with the authors of Ray from Berkeley. Uh, this provides, it's sort of a marriage between task parallel, uh, distributed computing for task parallel pattern, and actor pattern. And so it was originally developed at, at Berkeley Rise Lab to support reinforcement learning, uh, and to do that in, in Python. Uh, but it can be used to parallelize a lot of different types of Python applications. And, and we use it some for our knowledge graph work. Uh, I, I should mention also that in addition to what Radha Mahasia had originally specified, um, Pytext rank has a few modifications. Uh, there was a bug in the original pseudocode for the paper. And so, uh, you know, we, we were able to identify that and correct that. Um, there was earlier job implementation that was used by a company called Share This about that, uh, where, where we fixed that bug. Also, the original paper had used stemming, um, whereas, you know, these days, of course, we, we typically use lemmatization instead of, of stemming. Um, I found through experimentation, I found that including verbs in the graph tends to produce better results. Uh, the verbs are not emitted as part of the rank key phrases, but um, linking them does tend to add some information content into the graph. Um, I, I don't have metrics to justify that. It's still somewhat of an assertion on my part, but I'm, I am looking for being able to show uh, uh, better proof of that. Another thing about high text rank in contrast to the original algorithm, uh, if the NLP system that you're working with, if the NLP library supports named entity resolution and noun chunking, then uh, Pytex rank actually builds on top of those. Uh, so if, if you can get those and they're efficient, uh, then you can build on top of them and hopefully provide even richer results than they do. And lastly, Pytex rank has been, uh, my implementations of text rank have been uh, built to allow for uh, some form of knowledge graph to augment the, the, the graph that's constructed. And arguably, this is, this is a kind of transfer learning. Um, I'll talk about this in a, in a few slides coming up ahead. Uh, Pytext rank, those features are currently in development for Pytext rank, um, but this was something that uh, definitely we proved out in an earlier Java implementation. And, and just a note here, um, you know, going back to 2004, if you talk to people about NLP, they would probably be talking about things like n-grams and stemming, bag of words. We had a lot less computation in 2004. Um, these days, we have a lot faster uh, hardware, definitely. Um, so stemming was a way to be computationally efficient, but it does destroy information. Uh, Lemmatization is uh, much more effective, especially for this kind of work with text rank. So you're using part of speech to be able to look up the root for a word. Uh, but the interesting thing there is that that's uh, where we get this introduced notion of linking. And we can take a word, uh, however it's conjugated or, or pluralized, uh, and then we can link to what its lemma is. But we can also go through uh, like WordNet or other resources or a knowledge graph, which would be more customized, and be able to link out to other relations, sin sets, um, you know, track hypernyms for like superclass or hyponyms for subclass. Um, so I, I think that moving away from stemming toward limitization was kind of that key that this could be used for knowledge graph. 
Um, in terms of other implementations, uh, I, I used to run a very large instance of Hadoop in the cloud. And uh, so we'd done an implementation of uh, TextRank for Java uh, to run on Hadoop. That was back in 2008. Uh, about the same time, uh, Radim at Gensim uh, was doing a Python and NumPy implementation of TextRank, and that one's very efficient. Um, Jeff Kubina had also done an implementation in Perl. And, uh, oh, I should mention, too, that the, the first implementation I did, I really tried hard to make it language independent. I had language models for English and Spanish and, and did work on that, but you could plug in with other languages. Um, and then rolling the clock out about five years, um, Karen Christensen did uh, an Icelandic version of it in, uh, in Java. Um, I used to be the evangelist for Apache Spark, so I, I rewrote in Scala. I did uh, you know sort of an exercise in functional programming. I did a, a, a Spark Scala-based uh, text rank. And then also notably, um, Burton DeWilde did uh, Textacy in 2016, and he had, and has an implementation of TextRank in there. Um, that's also a really good project. I, I really like Textacy. Um, you know, in terms of other approaches, uh, definitely uh, back in the day, if you talked about NLP, people would talk about n-grams. Um, and I really like TextRank because it was it was moving beyond that. Um, but that was 15 years ago. Uh, there is still a lot of discussion about using bag of words. And I, I wanted to pull up this paper as just kind of a counterfactual. Um, bag of words is questionable. And it's definitely susceptible to being gamified, to, to being attacked, if you will, um, by, by poor quality texts or, or texts that have the wrong intention, really. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in natural language understanding that goes into more depth. Now, definitely, there's been amazing work in terms of Transformers, um, the whole Sesame Street crowd, um, starting with Elmo and then going on through BERT and GPT-2, et cetera. And I'm sure that everyone here in the audience, you're living and drinking this all day. Um, it's really fantastic work that's happening in these models, although it's not without some criticisms. And, and certainly there are trade-offs and diminishing returns in some areas. Um, I mean, I, I think it's fantastic, and, and I do use some of this modeling myself, um, particularly you know, looking at some recent results, more recent results, say, out of Distelbird and others. Uh, it, it's really fantastic how this has evolved. On the other hand, there are criticisms. Um, if you haven't seen this paper, I highly recommend. It's from last year, Energy and Policy Considerations. Uh, basically, if you want to train a GPT-2 model from scratch using neural architecture search uh, and you run that in the cloud, that has the carbon footprint of uh, effectively 50 people for their entire lifetime or uh, effectively uh, five cars, including the fuel use for, for their entire lifetime. And so, I, you know, we, we uh, now clearly, not everybody in the world is going to be training a deep learning model for natural language, but still there's a lot. And, you know, we, we have to think about where are the trade-offs in this? Um, how does the modeling fit the use case? Uh, because frankly, working with transformers is great. They're really powerful, but even the fine tuning is going to take me, you know, a half hour to run on a pretty beefy instance. Um, so if I have jobs that require really low latency and fast turnaround, I might want to be considering other types of modeling, something more lightweight. And, and the other criticism, too, I think, which is, which is really apt, is about reproducibility. Um, there's been kind of this like uh, war of the scientific papers between Allen NLP and, and Google and Microsoft and others where you know, they keep publishing these papers so rapidly one-upping each other's results. Um, but the, the problem is, if you really look at the budget that it takes, I mean, financially, what is the, the cash, the money required to reproduce the results, as well as what are the energy requirements and what are the outcomes in terms of, of heat and, and carbon? Um, so it, it does beg the question of, if there's only a handful of companies who can actually participate 
and confirm reproducible results for their own papers. You know, what, what does that really say about science? I mean, are, are we are we really um, providing science uh, or are we creating an oligarchy? So I, I, I am taking these two criticisms with uh, some grain of salt. I mean, depending further evolution of hardware, I think we we'll probably have a lot of breakthroughs there. Um, there's a lot of interesting work on, on distillation methods, which I think address some of this. Um, definitely better ways to do fine tuning and transfer learning uh, in general. I, I, you know, I, I think that these criticisms can be addressed. Um, also, I, I mentioned in the talk description that I would discuss named entity resolution. Um, what TechStrength does and what NER does, they're not exactly the same. Um, they, they both have their purposes, I believe. I mean, NER, especially here, is uh, a recent video about Spacey's NER model. Um, NER can, is getting more and more sophisticated, and it does give you more information in terms of, you know, is this a place, is this a person? Um, in, in the comparisons that I've run, typically text rank will come out with more of the key phrases that you would expect, whereas NER will, will tend to have less key phrases. So less recall, if you will, although it does have more information associated with it. Um, but again, uh, text rank leverages uh, both noun chunking and, name, and NER uh, to try to build on those results. Um, now, as, as far as articulating the, the benefits for this, again, no training is required. It's language independent, so long as there's language support and spacey for the given language. Um, it, it'll make use of NER, but it can still extract a richer set of phrases, typically. It's a very fast runtime. Uh, you, get, you get relatively fast responses running network memory. Um, and and another point, which I, I think is subtle and not brought out often enough, is that this is very intentionally built as part of the pipeline. It's meant to be integrated very, uh, very inexpensively uh, with a lot of other things. Um, it's not meant to subsume a pipeline. And so, you know, one of my criticisms over the past couple of decades of a lot of the NLP frameworks that I've worked with is so often you'll find something that's that's really good, but it kind of takes over everything else. You know, they, they want to own the pipeline, they want to provide all the features. And the idea of modularity kind of goes out the window once you head down that path. So I really love how Spacey has been very opinionated and they've been very careful to provide exactly what's needed, no more, not to get in anybody's way. And I, I tried to be faithful to that sort of philosophy. And as a result, we find that, that PyTextRank is being integrated in a, a wide range of different kinds of use cases. Uh, I, I, again, the lightweight part comes in handy. Um, it's highly portable across domains, this approach. And also, let's talk about knowledge graph. Um, so, one way to think about this is that PyTextRank is producing annotations in stream as you're processing a text document. Um, but an important point there is that when you're working with a document, there are probably other kinds of metadata that are attached. In some cases, that metadata may be localized. Uh, so if you're, if you're parsing uh, a research paper and you use a tool like Parser or SPV1, um, you know, you'll get the different section headings, and by virtue of going out to, say, discovery services, you may be able to get metadata. Um, so case in point, uh, author list, uh, what is the journal, uh, get some sort of uh, machine-readable citation graph, citation links off that, um, and, and other types of metadata. So the idea here is that if you have a large corpus of research papers and you want to construct an all graph, uh, we can think of a process here. Uh, number one, parse each PDF. And, and again, I recommend using something like Parser. Uh, number two, run Spacey and TextRank to identify the top key phrases. And you may, uh, depending on the application, you may be interested in certain sections of papers. Like for instance, with uh, rich context, we're very interested in the method section of research papers. Um, 
other use cases might be interested in the conclusions or the citations. Uh, I won't go into too much detail there, but but the idea is that you can be specific. And then number two, you can uh, query discovery services to get the additional metadata and then take that those combined annotations, the key phrases and the other metadata, and you can use this as training for vector embeddings. Um, once you have a, a trained model that way, you can flip it around, use it as an oracle, and query it. And then the distances between an entity and its closest neighbors, those can become edge weights for constructing a graph. Um, now, this kind of approach can be sensitive to you know noisy data. You can get a lot of junk in there. But um, there are some really interesting methods for being able to prune and filter. Um, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend taking a look. Uh, there's something called multi-scale backbone. Uh, sorry. Yeah, multi-scale backbone. Uh, and there's a, a kind of implementation called a disparity filter. Um, a lot of what I've seen about pruning a graph is, is really too focused on nodes and measuring centrality. Um, I think... To, to really prune a graph effectively, you need to consider both the nodes and the edges. So centrality is one way of filtering for nodes to nodes. And then disparity is sort of the dual of the problem. It's, it's sort of filtering for edges to edges. But um, I implemented a disparity filter. It's open source in Python on GitHub. Um, and so this basic formula is a way of being able to do some automated or semi-automated uh, knowledge-based construction. Um, of course, you know, if you have people in the loop, uh, you can get into more active learning kinds of modes, uh, have a lot more feedback involved with it as well. And that's a general sketch of, of how we're doing your rich context. Um, okay, so I, I mentioned about using TextRank uh, being able to consume from a graph, a knowledge graph. And so I've experimented with that in a few ways. Um, one of the quickest ways, though, is to take WordNet. And so if you have a word like cat, then cat as a usage as a noun, uh, a mammal, feline, <clears throat> it's hy hyponym. The super class for it, the hypernym, uh, would be, say, feline. And maybe a hypernym for that might be mammal. And a hypernym for that might be chordate. Um, actually, I'm sure there's a lot more in terms of biological categories, but uh, you can think of that, of, of looking at an entity and being able to trace the links out to its superclasses, its hypernyms. Similarly, you can go the other direction and get more specific. You can look at a cat and say, well, a hyponym, a subclass of that would be a kitten, an adolescent cat. Um, or there may be different kinds of cats. Um, and then you can also go horizontally. You can take a look at sin sets uh, to see where there are synonyms and other usages that are related. Um, so the general idea here is that when we're, when we're working with text rank, we're trying to build a graph, and then we run eigenvector centrality on the graph to be able to rank the phrases. So because of that, if there's any way that we can augment that graph, we're probably going to converge toward better results. So if you can go into a resource like, like WordNet and be able to do a, a boundary search and find what are some of the, the other kinds of relations and links that are close to an entity, um, then you could possibly find additional links to add into your graph. Um, so import those in and then run the centrality measures. And in a way, this is this is comparable to transfer learning because now you can take text rank, which is domain independent, but you can actually amplify it by adding a knowledge graph about a particular domain if you know that the documents in a corpus are related to that domain. So as an example here, if I had a document that was talking about cat and dog, um, and, you know, maybe I'd recognize those, but I wouldn't necessarily know that a cat was related to a kitten. But if I can do a, a, a bounded search within some sort of resource, like WordNet or like a knowledge graph, then I can find what are the neighboring links, other entities that, that are closely associated. And if I were to go back into my source document 
I could link cat with kitten or cat with feline, um, dog with puppy, that kind of thing. Uh, of course, this can be very computationally expensive. So, you know, bounded searches are, are very much recommended, but it is basically doing a breadth for search. Uh, and there's a there's some examples for how to support this. Um, also in Spacey, there's another pipeline extension that's called Spacey WordNet. And uh, this was written by a, a good friend of mine, Daniel Villasuero from Recognize. Uh, it's an AI company based in Spain. And uh, uh, Daniel and I have done some teaching together. Um, I also am one of the advisors for the company. Um, but they they took the NLTK interface to WordNet, and then they used that to bridge, uh, get, basically provide a Python interface for uh, Spacey to put WordNet annotations. And, and the interesting thing is they do provide some interesting ways of, of uh, constraining it by domain. Um, so I've got an example there, um, but it's really only a step away from what it takes to, to link that into TextRank. And that's some work that's currently in progress. Uh, and so a use case for this, uh, we are using, as I mentioned, about uh, parsing PDFs with parser and then running text rank to extract out key phrases and then doing some automated knowledge based construction. Um, we are using this in conjunction with the rich context uh, machine learning competition. Um, so, so basically we take and develop this corpus that has, you know, thousands of research publications linked in it with links to data sets and authors and whatnot. Uh, we go and grab the open source PDFs for those papers. We parse them and run text rank on it uh, so that we can extract out the key phrases. And then from there uh, are also doing work with embeddings um, with a goal of, of building recommender systems for rich context. But in a way, it's sort of pre-digesting the input providing better features as a starting point for this machine learning competition. Okay, I think that's about all I've got there. I can cut back over. I'd love to go back through any parts here or answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peko. Uh, so we are ready to take some questions. Anybody of us? The questions. So, Pico, I must say that uh, I really loved the, the, the discussion about the carbon footprints and the raising behind SOTA in NLP. So, uh, that, that was really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, I, I have a question for you, uh, if I may. Uh, you've talked with Rada, and I believe also um, was uh, Bruce DeWild had spoken here previously. Yeah, uh, I I spoke to Rada in uh, in in twenty eighteen in Colin, I guess. Okay. So uh, yeah, so that was just uh, she came there for a keynote talk and we had a talk since I had used take strike for some time, so I had to talk uh, with Rada regarding that and nothing as such in, in specific. Well, I, I, I was I was curious if Bruce went into any of his implementation about text strike. I've never had a chance to speak with him about it, but I, I look forward to catching up at some point. Oh, okay, okay sure. Uh, anybody have any question? Uh, so I think Peko, it was uh, quite uh, quite impressive and it was it was quite uh, explained to all and we have already the um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the presentation with us and uh, uh, I guess some of us would try to would definitely try Pytex track and then maybe can catch with up with you offline. Certainly. Uh, however I can help, I'd be very happy to. Um, there's been an interesting community that's that's developed around Pytext ranks. So, um, you know, we, we do have uh, issues on GitHub and, and people will answer or, or discuss uh, different approaches there. Is, I am curious, is anyone in your, uh, or anyone here working on automated means for constructing knowledge graphs? Yes. Yes. Interesting, yeah. Uh, have you ha have you used that approach of using a embedding model as an oracle for for construction? No, sir. Actually, we are extracting relations and uh, class relations and entities by using some uh, libraries, and then we are manually constructing the knowledge graph. Okay, gotcha. 
very good very good so what it was in context of which which domain it is in context of aircraft domain and we are taking help of some aircraft domain experts to classify the clusters that we have obtained through our uh, our uh, text data that is in unstructured format very good very good thank you i'm, I'm very glad to learn about that uh, so with that i guess it must be very late at your end because thank you for your time and uh, we wish to have you again in, in uh, some of our uh, lp talks thank you thank Thank you very kindly. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present. I wish you all a very good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.